Yeah, so um, let's jump into challenges. Um, so what we actually were trying to solve, maybe you, some of you find yourselves having similar issues or challenges we've been having ourselves. First thing is the fast pace of literally everyone. So pretty much everyone complains about being understaffed in InfoSec and it's getting worse. But it's even like the developers don't really have time to do security. So if you tell the developers to do something every sprint or do some security steps in every feature, they even if you tell, OK, you are provide just consulting to them and empowering them, they won't really have time for themselves as they have um, times to uh, deliver as well. Next topic we were trying to solve is um, documentation or security documentation. So in case you are having a team and you are supposed to do some review of some architecture concept, you, I think in most cases, the agile development, you will find yourself having not really enough information for actually doing the review, not having enough documentation. So basically you are doing the review based on your gut feeling or second option is that you get the development team into workshops where again you spend their their times and you're getting less efficient um another topic is that um i have the feeling that um security still tries to define sdls kind of in kind of waterfallish way in all forms of agile development so um, there is not really much. And so once the security um, actually understood how the development process of a development team looks like, the development team does a retrospective and changes their development. And you're, you're starting, uh, starting over. So um, what we were more heading to is, what's, or what I believe it works better, it's like doing SDL on artifact basis rather than a project basis where simply you agree with the, with the development team on a goal they're supposed to achieve, but it's their job actually to find a way how, how, to, how to achieve the goal, how to make sure that they are not vulnerable to SQ injection or, or whatever else. That gives you also uh, way more sustainability because in the real world, usually unless you have exactly one project telling one artifact and then you never touch it again. You usually find yourself in a situation where you have one artifact living maybe five years and you have many projects touching it. So in the kind of the days actually what you're always um, interested in is the current state of security of the artifact and the more projects you have the more complicated it gets to actually find out not only for the security team, what the security properties of the artifact are, but especially for the teams who are supposed to develop the artifact with a constant agreed security level. Um, what is also an issue, maybe some of you as an example have been facing GDPR. And um, was the issue that you develop some artifact to a certain time, but at the same time the security requirements develop. So they don't freeze in 2012, but they continue developing. And what's very difficult for the teams is actually to identify a gap. So what, at least to know, what are the requirements they should be complying with to a particular moment. Also, it's not only regulations. It's only if you have a look at browser security, there are features coming all the time. As examples, I know same site cookies or the new refer policy header. And it's kind of, it would be good and nice for development teams to know, okay, so we've, developed, we've implemented only three of the security headers in the browser, but now there are a new one coming and to be informed about that. Yeah, and last challenge we've been also dealing with is um, that many companies also outsource development of applications. And what I find a lot of companies doing is actually being meanwhile pretty good in internal development, but not handling the external development that well. So we had a, for instance, situation where some customer um, announced a self XSS, so rather trivial bug, and the development team stopped working 
on the features, and within half a day they were live with the fax with the fix. Then we had another situation where another customer reported us true XSS, but being developed an external artifact, and that's unless you have defined the same rules for both internal and external development with with the partner, then you will most probably find yourself negotiating with the, with the partner when they are able to give you resources for the development, how much is going to, to cost and so on. While for the customer, it's still system developed by your company because obviously they don't know what's, going to, what's developed internally and what's externally. So the solution we came with um, and we developed in the first place internally and then we open sourced it. We are since um, actually yesterday in the official project inventory of OLASP is called Security Red. It's not a small animal or big mouse. Red stands for Requirement Automation Tool. And the idea of the tool is very basic. Yeah, is that first you being security role, you say, okay, what are the parameters of the application you're going to develop? So. What is the criticality? What is the, is it mobile app, is it web service, and so on, whatever you can think of. Um, you get back the requirements which apply to you or your artifact for the time being, and you decide how to handle those. So you decide, okay, do I want to do input relation? How do I want to do logging? How do I want to implement those? And then what we do, then we persist the state not in the tool itself, but in a Jira instance. So basically, we have a Jira dedicated queue, which we, let's say, it's somewhat asset management, you could call it, where we have all the artifacts next to each other, containing the defined properties in attachments, in YAML files, and telling not only to security team, but also developers, okay, what are the rules being agreed? And then, what we found out that many of the security requirements actually generate tickets. So in the beginning, we were having Excel file with the um, requirements and the teams, if they found out that they have to implement some requirement, then they went copy and pasting all the information from Excel. So now it's way easier for them actually to create the tickets, particular tickets in batch mode, according to different properties which gives them also then the complete transparency of what the, what the current state is. Yeah, um, we do it or we use security red in, let's say if we map it to the life cycle of the assets in two, two cases. So one obviously is if you have a new asset or a new, new artifact, you want to have a ticket as soon as possible in the development life cycle telling you based on the critical of artifact and the type what are the requirements you are going to fulfill and what are the rules. What we meanwhile are doing are also doing gap analysis to actually production assets, at least to the important ones. Obviously, and I think this idea was, told, was um, said here many times, you obviously want to go for the first one because if you are trying to find out what you thought of and what not, after a couple of years, the artifact life is going to be first expensive and second uh, far from ideal. Yeah, um, just to give you an idea, um, Rene will um, show you the basic functionality of the security red. Just a question from my side, who knows security red already? Could you raise your hand? Someone? Oh, sweet, so almost no one will be bored. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to give you a quick overview of security rats and what Daniel just expla explained in theory. We already have a pretty good tool outside now. It's, um, I think, version one we released uh, one and a half years ago. So it's quite mature now and we are currently planning version two. But to give you a, a quick overview, as Daniel already told, our first step is we need to define a new artifact. So let's assume we have a new artifact called example artifact. So artifact, and now we need to add the parameters to that artifact. So what, what, what we are, want to develop. So uh, in the background and the database, the current requirement set is over ASVS. 
for the application security verification standard. So first of all, I need to apply a level um, which I want to achieve. Let's say I have only, uh, yeah, let's go for level two standard in ASVS. And what kind of artifact type do I need to, or do I want to implement? Is it a front-end application, a web service, a mobile app? Nevertheless, all the parameters you see here, they are freely configurable. So you can add your own parameters as, as what you want. So if you're a SCADA um, systems you want to develop, you can easily add that as types as well. So everything is free configurable in, in Security Red. Nothing is hard coded here. So let's assume we have a front end application. Um, what is authentication? Let's say we have a single sign on client and a session management. We are using session IDs and the reachability is uh, externally, which means it's internet facing just to say what kind of implementation type and hit generate. What Security Red now, now does is it looks in the database what requirements are actually meet those parameters we have applied. So and what we see is on the left side, 107 requirements found. The whole ASVS standard contains 182 requirements. So we actually got rid of uh, 75 requirements because of parameterization. So for the development team, it's now much easier to know what are we really have to do and what not, because we already skipped 75, which are not necessary for the development team. So we do not need to annoy them with requirements. They always say that's not something we need to do because it's not part of our technology stack. So what you then do is um, you usually, you see here all the ASVS requirements. You see the description of the requir requirement. We also enrich our requirements with more information. So you'll get a link to all of us cheat sheets. And if you are um, a security guy, you should now set up a meeting with the, with the lead architect and the lead developer and go through each requirement and say, what's the strategy on that? So how do we fulfill it? So um, again, those values, those are just examples from our side. You can easily customize that for your, what fits best for your corporation. Um, so you go through each requirement and say, okay, how do we handle that requirement? Oh yeah, verify that all application components are identified and are known to be needed. Um, okay, yeah, we should do that. So you just write in here something like, okay, yes, um, fulfilled means we need to do that, need to do, etc. So you go through the whole list with a development team of all the requirements and attach your strategy and write a comment on how specifically this requirement is done by the team. So now um, you need to persist it somewhere. As Daniel already told, um, we are going to use Jira for that. For that. So what we say is we have a big save button here. Uh, we apply, okay, save that requirement. Um, we can export it to Jira or into a flat file, but we would recommend Jira more because it's better for the tracking afterwards, I will show. So let's grab a Jira queue I have created and just say, okay, we want to save that artifact in that specific Jira queue and hit export. Um, what it does now, it contacts the Jira server and asks for, okay, what kind of issue types that queue is going to offer, what can I do? So it asks directly the Jira API. I can say it's a task, sorry, bug, whatever you put in Jira here. So let's assume as a task. And I can also configure additional fields if I want, like I'm directly set an assignee or whatever Jira is proposing to us. So let's export it. <coughs> the Wi-Fi is kind of slow here because we're doing it live on the web. So sorry if this sometimes takes a little bit of time to load. So, and Security Red now to to tells me that it uh, has exported that and we saved it in the Jira queue. Uh, we can have a quick look, um, depending how long it takes to load. Okay, we wait until it is loaded. Otherwise, I will just explain you now that I, we have created the artifact ticket, which is, holds as a main ticket where we can see the status. What we should now do is, um, go as we went through each requirement and said, yes, we need to fulfill that. We need to push those tickets also to a, a development queue. So what you can easily do is say, okay, let's, let's filter uh, on everything which is yes. Apparently, as for example, this is only one requirement at the moment, as I've only selected one. Select those, and again, as a batch job, you can create those in a different queue. Um, like here, it's my second queue is Agile Dev, which is, for example, the uh, dev queue, and I can create it. Again, it asks Sarah what kind is possible. So let's assume back, just for example, and create those batch tickets. So, and those tickets get linked to the artifact tickets as well. So you, of course you see a tracking. I will show you afterwards. So it has created those. Um, here's the artifact ticket. 
um, where you see it puts um, every information as a YAML file, as an attachment into that artifact. And if I reload it, because I've now created another ticket, um, let's see how long it will take. Um, you will see that there's another development ticket linked to it and another YAML file because we made an update to, update to the artifact. So we have version versionizing here. We always see what was the version at a certain point of state during the time. Okay, so here you see now we have two attachments included here. Um, this is the update and we now have a relates to. It's another queue, that's a dev ticket. So usually you would go all through requirements now and, and create tickets and create comments. So I've prepared, prepared um, a more rather big example um, before that. You have, you see we have more than nearly 40 tickets here. Um, directly Security Red will also post comments to that artifact ticket whenever an update is. So you easily have a link here which you can just click um, in your Jira and, and automatically imports now that artifact with the uh, current status into security red. So again, this will take, depends a little bit on the Wi-Fi speed. <clears throat> and yeah, now, give me a second. Okay, now it's loaded. So as you see, here is here are a lot of more tickets already created. I can now see in security red the status of each ticket. So I can see what have the development team done. Are there any problems? Have they closed the ticket? I directly see, okay, those are in progress. Some might maybe still in to-do. Some are maybe already done. So I know, okay, they achieved this requirement. That's nice to know. So what I also can do is um, I see here some in progress, some in to-do. Okay, to-do means, hmm, they are, maybe they are un un uh, unsure about what they want to do. So maybe I should set up a quick call with them and explain them what they need to do. So what we can also do is do a quick filter um, on everything what's to do. So you see 30 requirements are currently in a to-do state. So uh, I need to talk to those guys. As I'm very lazy, and I think a lot of you are, I do not want to create slides by myself. It's annoying, I guess. So I just select it and say, okay, create some slides for me with only the specific requirements which are currently in to-do. So let's say my name is Rene and say, okay, um, create those. It's, you can add seams like that. So Security Red will now create slides based on just the requirements you have selected. And when it's going to load, you will see an HTML5 slide deck based on Reveal.js. If it's going to load, now it's loaded and you see I have everything inside. Um, I can browse through the requirements. So what do we have here? Description, more information, fulfilled no, and see the comment. So I can easily create slide decks automatically if, if I see there's a problem within the development team. Also what Daniel mentioned is you're going to have external development. Maybe you don't want to give your external service provider access to security red. So okay, there need to be a way where you can export the requirement and send it to him. So we also support legacy um, technologies. Uh, we call that Excel. So you can also export it, of course, to Excel the requirement sheets, which needs to be um, discussed or anything else, and can send it via mail or whatever. So this is also possible within Security Red. Um, also, what I need to mention is Daniel said, okay, requirements live. They're going to be updated over the time. So how to face that? I mean. Um, how should, should the development team know that there are some updates now and they need to do something? Um, what you might see on, on the right side, a new red button popped up when I imported the artifact and it, it, it says updates available. So maybe um, something changed in my requirements and the artifact is not up to date anymore because the security team decided that they added new requirements or maybe deleted one or changed some requirements because they said, okay, we have a new technology we need to support. So what I can easily do is click on updates available. What it will now do, it will look in the back end. What other new updates? It will tell me, okay, two requirements were updated. No new requirements were found and new were removed from your current requirement set you have here. So, and what I see in then is a nice overview for me two requirements are actually updated. And I see the first one is, in red is the old requirement, in green is the new updated requirement. 
And I, as a project manager or security guy, can now decide, do I want to accept that change in my current requirement set, or do I want to decline it? So here I say, okay, it's, uh, the, this topic is regarding account password hashing, and the security says now I should use Argon2 as a hashing algorithm, which is actually a good idea. So yeah, I'm going to accept that in my requirement set. And the next one is regarding content security policy from ACS, and they added a new link um, where I can check my CSP policy if it's correct. So I add that too. I click, just click accept. And uh, now I have updated my requirement set, and I can go on and face those new updates again. So that's from my side. That, those were the features we already had since version 1 or version 1.5 but we are not sitting around and doing nothing. We have developed some cool new features in the last couple of months, which are going to be presented by Daniel now. Yeah, so that was the content you might have seen in previous conferences and what we did till then. Basically, we found out that um, we kind of sp speeded up the proactive process, but then we landed up with a lot of stuff to test. So basically, if the, if the team um, develops, I don't know, creates content security policy, they come around and want to know, okay, so tell me what you think about it. So how would it be to automate then? And we came with a new tool called Security Cat in this case. Cat not as an animal again, but compliance automation tool. And the idea of the tool is that when Security Red, you say, what uh, the, it's not really working. And uh, then in a security red, you, t you say, okay, what are the requirements you want to test? We are, we are cores, so the same mechanism we use to integrate with the Jira, so everything goes through, through browser, which um, has the advantage that you don't need any special system users for a red. You go to security cat, telling, okay, I want to test these five requirements, and you get the results immediately. We push it also a bit further. So what does it mean to test a requirement? If you have a, if you have a look at requirements, um, you will find out some of them are better to uh, test with some um, OWASP standard tools. For some of them, you want to have your custom checks. For some of them, you want to check out the GitHub uh, or Git, Git code and, and find out. So basically, a security cat for us is basically microservice architecture, having a gateway, dispatching the requirements to microservices which are supposed to test those and giving back the results. Also, what's important in order to be able to implement these in different pipelines and so on, the client doesn't necessarily have to be only the guy or the, the developer who wants to check whether he implemented the requirement okay, but it can be also Jenkins or, or, or whichever whichever machine system. So um, in order to show you how it works, again, um, this, that was the um, artifact you already opened, right? Yeah, you can use that. So here we have also like for filtering capabilities, we have several options and what we can say, give me all requirements which are testable with security cat. Um, what is important to understand, we don't understand ourselves as providing the methodology or the requirement set because every company has its own. So basically what we provide here is now ASVS, but that's also the reason why Security Cat is not open sourced. It's what is open source is the REST specification. Uh, what is also open source is proof of concept to show you in Python how to quickly, how quickly do it. But basically, you need to write the test according to your own requirements, which, you're, which, you're, which you want to follow. So here as a proof of concept, we have three requirements. Or easy one, so regarding basically HTTP header configuration, we can tell here test requirements. There are several fields, so what we support for the moment is that you can enter uh, the application URL where you want to test. You can um, uh, provide the code, source code management URL, so, so Git or SVN, and uh, also Sonacube key if you want to use it, because Sonacube also usually comes with quite a lot of possibilities to how to test security. So let's say we, in this proof of concept, we have some application. So let's test, for instance, how securityheaders.io implements security headers. Uh, 
And this is the API, which is self-signed certificate is not that nice. So let's start again. So now the, the microservice is conducting security headers. IO, and what we see, we have these three security requirements, and we see, okay, all of them are fulfilled together with the, with the details as we support markdown, so we can also display more information. What's also important idea, basically with any automated tools, you can usually test any requirement up to certain probability. So what we have is confidence level, explicitly defined, because what we also do is that, for instance, we test certain requirements with more services. So what we implement internally, we have, for instance, for XSS, we have one microservice talking to OWASP ZEP and uh, running it up in Docker instance and testing it. We have also custom checks. We also look in the code. And then for every requirement, you, you see, OK, ZEP thinks you're good. Source code review means is it not good. And you also see directly the confidence levels, which you have defined in security CAT. Uh, before so that the client can see, okay, which information, for instance, to trust. Yeah, so that would be the, the testing. Obviously, it's also possible to access this information uh, via JSON so that you can consume it in, uh, with uh, service users. And uh, uh, we have also nice, kind of nice second feature, which we like to show, which we released just last week. And basically, the idea is that Agile relies a lot of trainings. So in order to, for people to be able to work with security red and be self-sufficient, they need to understand what the security requirements are and what are we trying to, to tell. So we used to do this with PowerPoint, which leads to the fact that as you update your requirements continuously, then you need to update the PowerPoint as well. Who does that? All right, so um, how would it be if basically based on the, let's say, knowledge base or requirements based on security cut, you could develop your trainings? And it's kind of extension of the um, feature Rene already showed. So if I close here, everything, I ignore changes. I go to trainings. Ah, now we're loading from the cloud again. Okay, so. Here, what I can do, I have one training prepared. I can create new training. I can say, okay, test training. I can select requirements which I want to present. So for instance, here, do I want to do full ASVS, full-blown training? Or for instance, if I say, okay, no, because I'm doing um, training for a backend team. So I say, okay, I will just keep um, requirements run for web services in it. So you can configure it as you, as, you, as you want. You can see, okay, 170. So we didn't save too much. We can also say what kind of information you um, want, to, want to add. So we have this concept that rec every requirement for us is a skeleton, which is, for instance, the ASVS um, wording. And then we have column, extra columns like motivation. Why do you want to do that? What happens if you don't do it? Uh, we have the more information which we have here, so links to either internal or external sources. Or we have, for instance, test case for, for the requirement, how to test for it. So you can, we here, in this set, we have just one slide. So we say, OK, we want to include it. And now we can see the tool will generate one 340 slides. And the nice thing, I will not generate now because of the <laughs> Would, would take a bit, but these, the, the idea is these slides, they remain current, always, always, uh, always up to date. So if you change your requirements, it's going to be uh, always on, the, on new, new, uh, new content. If you move them within categories, if you add categories, if you um, delete requirements, add new ones, um, your training is going to be up to date. Actually, I need to generate it in order to show you. It won't actually quite. At fast. Obviously, you don't want to present only static content, right? Texts. So here it generates some pretty fine structure. Here we have the ASVS requirements. And you say, OK, this is like if we show only this on the slides, it will be kind of boring, right? So what you can do, obviously, you can do 
either write your own slides in HTML or you can define your template. So let's say I want definitely a picture there. I want there also, let's say some code block. So here you can also take advantage of, of all the HTML5 things so that um, the, um, which highlight the, the code for you, which is also an issue in PowerPoint. You can obviously add, for instance, videos, um, or you can also leverage the capabilities in, in, in the internet. You will find a lot of stuff which you can play with. So for, on, for instance, you can, you can here include a Python shell from, from the internet. Then you add whatever you want, you save it, and you're good, you're good to go in order to show you how training can look like. Or basically, I generated one training exactly like this. It's going to be loaded, so in its default settings, this is stuff which is. Generate it, you can obviously edit it as you want. You have your pictures, code, videos, Python shell, whatever, whatever you like, you know, to make to your training more, more um, attractive. Yeah, and uh, last thing we are also playing around with that what if basically you have your requirements in machine readable form it gives you the advantage that you can automatically measure a lot of things. So this is just a very easy example to see uh, how, um, um, the dash how on a dashboard the statistics for one team can look like. So they see, okay, we have 37 um, artifacts in total. And what we see here is that the current, the average age of the required definition for the low artifacts are 24 days, for the medium 200 days and for a high 90 days. So this gives you an idea that basically what you would be probably expecting and what the team actually wants is have probably the 20 days by high, 20, um, 90 days by medium, and 200 days by low. So this also gives them the information how to proceed. You can give them that all information you have in the YAML file. So um, for instance, what we do is that when we have the artifact live, we set the ticket in Java in progress. And then you can see the statistics, how many um, artifacts which are already live have still some requirements marked as to be clarified, because that's where you know something went wrong. And so you can play with this quite a lot. This is also obviously not part of security, security red itself for for the moment, but it's just for you to give you an idea how to also use and work with this information. Right, and now I would hand over to Rene for the final part, so what we are up to now. Yeah, so just give you a quick hint over what we are currently doing and what we are going to plan with security red. So first of all, security red loves ASVS. Uh, we have uh, first time integrated ASVS here into Security Red, and we are going to release uh, the ASVS requirement dump file in the next couple of next days in our GitHub repo, so you can start with Security Red and A ASVS within minutes. So you can just dump, uh, import the dump into Security Red, and what we, we have seen here, all the security requirements and all the parameters we have shown today, they are already included in the dump. So if you want to play around, give it a go. Also, we love Ovas Virtual Village. Uh, I had the chance to meet the guys from Ovas Virtual Village um, two days ago, and we are currently in discussion that they will give us a, a virtual machine so we can set up a security red permanent demo machine on the internet so that you, as a potential user, no need to install it locally. You can just browse to a website we're going to announce, and you can just play around with security red and see if it fulfills your needs or not. So this is going to be also up in the next couple of, hopefully, days, maybe weeks. Let's see how quick the virtual village team is able to give us um, access to the in, uh, infrastructure. Next thing, um, what we are going to plan, and as we are currently planning version two of Security Red, at the moment, you can enrich every requirement with a so-called, we call that alternative instance. 
So let's say you have a specific information to Java developers. You can enrich every requirement um, and say, okay, for that specific requirement, OE01, um, we have for the developer, if it's a Java uh, developer, specific information how to do it in Java code exactly. So this is part of the current security red already. But we want to do um, it more at the creation of the artifact. So if you create the artifact with the parameters, you can directly select then what kind of technology you're going to develop your artifact. Is it Java? Is it PHP? Is it maybe C++? And you will automatically see those enhanced um, enrichments directly at on the requirements. You do not have to select it manually. Also, um, as Daniel has presented, Security Cat. Uh, it was a little bit of a proof of concept for us. It works. We developed it as a separate gateway, but we think now for version two, we will integrate Security Cat directly into Security Red. So there's no gateway for testing requirements anymore. Um, Security Cat will be directly integrated into Security Red and can orchestrate the microservices where you want to test your requirements for directly from Security Red. Gives you a little bit less deploy time and less configurable time for any, everything. Next thing, import of requirement sets. Um, we got a little bit of feedback from users out there and they already told us, yeah, we have a huge requirement set in our company. It's an Excel file. Can we import it to Security Red? And we always say, no, at the moment not. At the moment, you need to go to the admin CRUD interface we have and you need to manually put in every requirement you have. So it's kind of time consuming. You only have to do it once, but I think for a large requirement set within 100 requirements, you need at least two or three hours to do that. So for version two, we're going to give you a feature to import your current requirement set directly into Security Cat, uh, Security Red, sorry. Um, yeah, this is going to be a feature for version two. And also rule sets will come. What do we mean with rule sets? So let's, for example, say you want to um, develop a microservice. Uh, you go to Security Red and say, I want to develop a level two opportunistic microservice, um, yeah, which is internet facing, for example. And then you can say, okay, you get a, your baseline requirements, maybe 20 requirements, and there's also a requirement that says you need to um, prevent SQL injection, of course, because you're developing a microservice. But then the developers say, hmm, but we are using it as technology stack, we are using Spring Boot. So there's Hypernate for us, which handles those, this requirement for us. There's no need for us to do anything because it's, because it's implicit handled by the technology stack. So we will add rule sets that you are able um, to say, okay, I want to develop a microservice for opportunistic level and the techno technology stack will be Spring Boot. So of course it will generate the same requirements for you, but the requirement, for example, SQL injection will have a strat strategy automatically applied implicit, implicit handled by technology. So there's no need for you to say, okay, do we have to do something? Oh no, it's implicit handled. Okay, that's fine for us. And last but not least, we want to add more integration to Security Red. At the moment, we have the Jira integration. Um, we also want to add more ticket systems. We want to integrate with JIT and, of course, chat systems, maybe to announce new requirements updates to your development teams, um, maybe Slack, maybe HipChat. And also a wiki integration is planned for some kind of documentation or you want to persist something. And those are actually the features we are going to plan for version 2.0. So that would, it, that would it for our presentation. First of all, thank you for your attention. And hopefully we will be happy if you give it a shot, Security Red, try it out for yourself. And if you can give us feedback, that would be really nice if it's good for you or maybe where, where are the problems for you. We would really be happy if you do a pull request because we are an open source project and we are only three developers currently developing it. But give it a shot, and if any problems, there are contact mail addresses. Contact at any time. We will give you a response. Thank you for your attention.